So what we're going to take is a simpler route towards the source description, this one. It's simple because now we have just one arrow and we can place it in a point. But what we have lost now is the rupture time. Please remember this. What is the only kinematic parameter that is left there? Well, the time necessary for the slip to occur. It's just one now. Well, that parameter is going to be called rise time. It's the time necessary for the whole system to move. And if you think about it, it should be much shorter than the one that we have lost. Okay. Now, once we make this approximation, we can say, can we rewrite the source term in something that can be treated here? The answer is yes. And we're going to represent the fault with the rupture, with the slip, with a system of equivalent body forces. And the final answer will be, yep, it is a double cup. Now, that's the end of the story. Now, you could ask, using intuition, why a double couple? Well, what is the simplest force that we can imagine? Well, it's like a hammer. The simplest one is a single force acting in a point at a time in one direction. Well, that's not an earthquake. Well, you could say, why not a couple? Well, with the couple, you open the door. That's a couple. And you have rotation. And unless you consider external forces, an earthquake is not causing rotations. So actually, taking into account that the total moment should be zero, the simplest system of body forces that could be equivalent to an earthquake is a double cup. And that's the answer. Now, the double couple is not an earthquake, of course, but it's the best equivalent body force system that can represent an earthquake when you consider it as a point. That's the representation theorem. It's not an earthquake, but it is a pivot. <laughs> so what we are gaining here, that we can insert here a double couple and we can solve the equation. It will not be easy, but we can do it. If we don't represent it, we cannot do any analytical trick here. Okay? Let's be logic. Now, let's be logic. And that's the map of what we should do today. And the road is not easy. One word here, one statement from my side. Everything actually is related by a seminal paper published in 1964 by Barijan You see the title here, Body Force Equivalence for Seismic Dislocations. Yep, that's the title. And that's the second part of the abstract. And I put it in bold, but for displacement dislocation, what we're going to call a shear dislocation, the double couple is an exact equivalent body force. That's the trick. A very simple statement. By the way, Leon Nopov visited Trieste and SP many times. He was giving lectures when I was a student. He passed away a few years ago. It was great, really great. He made a lot of contributions in many fields of seismology, not only seismology. But this is really a seminal paper. It's so seminal that there was a newer paper by Jose Pujol, and I'm going to show it in the next slide, that is explaining that paper, because the paper is not very easy. And just to add a piece of information here, one year before, Maruyama, a Japanese seismologist, published 
something very simple, but there is a difference here because they did the theory, they, they proved the theorem for a very general elastic body, also with not isotropic body. So it's really the most general paper that you can imagine. And there is another, let's be final, worthy slide here where you can get a piece of information. You can find in the library a book by Jose Pujol. This is a paper, but I, I was trying to download it. Now, um, ICTP has no access to seismological research letter, but maybe with some tricks you, you, you can do something. But okay, this paper here is supposed to be a tutorial of that. And what is nice here is that it contains some news about the history of the study of the earthquake dislocation, tectonic earthquake, the story, as you see, it's starting with Maruyama. And at that time, you have to know that there was a debate. What is the best double, um, sorry, what is the best force system to represent earthquakes. There was a debate because someone was thinking about a couple. Maybe it's better. Well, you could say, come on, how, how there could be a debate between a couple and a double couple? One should be the, the right one. Please remember that observational seismology started not a long time ago. The first recording was from 1906. Only in the 60s would be let's say, worldwide networks of observational seismology was beginning to be a sort of a, of a science and computers. So without those two conditions, there was no way to process you know, efficiently seismic waveforms to solve this debate. So the, actually the first answer came from theory. And there is another nice story here, but all the problem is coming from an Italian word used by Vito Volterra a long time ago, because this location is sort of the English version of distorsion. What is the, this location for us is what I'm trying to, to mimic with my hands since the first lecture, something like that. So you take a, an elastic body, you cut a surface somewhere before, so you're going to break it, but then you have a surface, and then you apply forces. What's going to happen? It's going to slide. That's the study of these locations. So that's the story. Now what we have to do is to take this road from the beginning till the representation of the theorem. But as I told you, it's too long, it's too hard for everyone. So I will show to you just some snapshots that should be, but I would like to can represent a sort of logical steps what we have to do. To do the whole algebra, we, we should take 10 hours, okay? We will not, just one. So, in the next slides, don't focus on, on the indexes of the algebraic variables there. Just try, let's try to understand what we have to do. What we have to do is to start from basic lasso dynamics. And so one of the First, equations that we have, it's in our box, in our bag, to do this, this road, is this. Now, at least three of you should recognize it, I hope, with one difference. F. Because when we, actually, I put it in the wave physics course, there was F here. But then we said, okay, come on. Who cares about the gravity for this table here when we want to understand its vibrations when we knock on that? So we said, okay, come on, F is not important, let's wipe it out. F is body force, is representing body force. And the normal standard body force on the Earth, for example, is gravity. Please do remember, if you're going to study fluids, liquids, Gravity is important because gravity waves are related to gravity force. But for a solid, gravity is acting, and 
creating an equilibrium now. If I don't touch the table, it's going to stay in equilibrium. Gravitational force is reacted by the, by the floor. That's it. Fine. If I knock it, OK, we can say, who cares about gravity? It's balanced. Let's study the transition in elastic forces, surface forces. OK. That's why, at that time, F was clean, because I was lazy. By the way, if you think about it, that's the equation of elastic motion. We call them Euler equations, and later Navier equations. Not the Navier Stokes, Navier equations. OK, you can think, in general terms, that it's a version of a differential operator. Like this one. Well, it's more complicated because here we have to consider the spatial gradient of stresses. That is a tensor. It's symmetric. We could, we could prove that. It's nice. Inside stress, we have generalized Hooke's law. If you do remember, and for a general body, that could be also an isotropic. Actually, we should take into account 81 components of the stress tensor, of uh, the constitutive equation. But now wait. Due to symmetries, also, also if the system is an isotropic, we have just 21. And if we assume an isotropic system, as we did in the wave physics, just two, lambda mu. I hope you do remember. OK. Now, what we did in the wave physics course was to solve this problem, like this one, when it was equal to zero. And we can call it homogeneous differential equation. If we have an F, it's called inhomogeneous. So it's like an algebraic equation equal to zero or equal to something. Now, we are going to, so that's our starting point. This is what we know. We have a body with a given volume with some boundary conditions. We're going to use it later. Well, that's strange earth. With a given volume and with a given external surface that we can assume some boundary conditions there, like the homogeneous standard ones, it's a free surface. Okay? What does it mean? OK. The radial components of stress, they have to vanish. OK, this is what we know. What we know is that in the first term, we were so lazy. I was so lazy that F was equal to 0. Why? Well, because for waves in solid, gravity is not that important. And we found P, S. OK, let me tell you just now what is going to be the end of the story. What about F in this equation? Well, F in this equation is a body force. So something that is acting on the body as a whole. It's dealing with the bulk matter that it is inside the body, like gravity. Or if it is made by iron, and you have a magnet here, it could be electromagnetic force. It's not elastic force. It's different. Elastic force is in the stress. Okay? Here we have the elastic forces. Now, what we're going to do today is to make, again, F to vanish. F as gravity. But we will switch it on again F, not as gravity, but as an equivalent body force that is representing an earthquake. And the simplest body force that we're going to define to use in a definition today is a hammer. That's the simplest one. We cannot imagine something simpler. Well, actually, we could imagine something simpler. Can you guess what it is? But it's not useful. 
if I'm applying a force in this direction here, okay, it's in a point, it's at a given time, it's a delta, space and time, but it has a direction. Now you can imagine that if I hammer, if I use my hammer in this direction, the waves that are generated in this direction, in this direction, and in this direction, they will be different. We will have a radiation pattern. And that's a complication. And you will see. Can you imagine something that has no radiation pattern? Right, because if we have something that is symmetric in space, it will be isotropic. The point is that it's an explosion. And an earthquake is not an explosion. Actually, I was debating this morning. So we don't need something like that. We will use it, but it's too simple. Because actually, an earthquake is made by one force, another force, another force, and another force. Okay. But you can imagine that this equation can be solved when F is not gravity, but a body force. And the simplest one is this. Actually, it's this leaving the hammer here. But it's not that simple, because we have direction. OK? Just as a thing. OK, the bad news now. Once we have that equation that is ruling the dynamics of our system here, we have now to try to deal with this body, with the volume D, the surface S, with some boundary conditions on that. But what we have to place there is a fault. That's our problem. So a cut where something is going to happen. OK, that's our time. Now the bad things will start now. I will go fast. Um, the most, how to say, most important details are written there. The whole story is narrated in Tuaki and Richards that you can find there. Almost no one is reading Aki and Richards. Uh, you can find a nicer version of the story in Jose Pujol textbook that you have in, in the library. It's not necessary. It could be useful, but it's your choice, OK? So what is necessary is just to understand what we're doing here today. Is the message clear? OK. Now, the first theorem that we're going to use for general elastodynamics is a very simple one. What it is saying, well, if we have an elastic line, now without the fault, with a given volume V, with a given surface F, with given body forces, so we give them the given F, well, the solution of elastodynamics exists, and it is unique. If it is not unique, we're lost. We, we, we cannot solve the problem. And the solution is saying, OK, look, if you want to find the displacement field inside the body, on the body, in the body, and you fix all the boundary conditions, in initial conditions, and body forces, OK, solution exists, and it is unique. What does it mean? OK, we can go and start towards the mountain. Otherwise, it's better to stay home. OK? Uniqueness. Good. The second one is strange. And in this version here, I, I, I'm simplifying here the writing because I, I'm getting out all the dependencies that are inside. So I'm cutting the parentheses. That's why it's short. It's a strange theorem. But it's actually what's going to become the representation theorem. So now, let's take our system with our fault. We fix boundary, um, boundary conditions and body forces, F. Good. The solution is U. Now we take another system of body forces and we call it G. And the solution is V. Now, 
those two solutions are not independent. And, and if you think about it, it's intuitive, because actually they belong, they stay inside the same body with the same boundary conditions. So they cannot be totally independent. The theorem is saying, it's called, it's one version of the Betty theorem with the integrals, is saying this. I know it's messy. But the message is the following. Look, that's the force system F that is giving you, okay? So that's the dynamics are there because we have U dot dot. That's acceleration. We have the tractions inside the body related to U. Because remember, body forces, we have displacement, and we have attractions inside, elastic forces. Good. Then we have G. We have V and the tractions related to V. As you see, they are coupled each other. Because here we have V, here we have U. So there is a sort of a relation between the two solutions. Now you could say, so what? Well, the next trick is to say, let's imagine that now we know the solution of one problem. If we know that, we can use this theorem to write the solution to the problem that we want to solve. So it's like a stair. We, can, we know how to make one step. This stair will take us to the step that we want to make. That's the trick. So this version of a theorem, that is one of the versions of that theorem, is relating to solutions belonging to the same elastic body, the Earth. Okay? Now you do understand, I hope, that if we know V, for example, given a, given a G and given this, then we can write, we can use this expression to write U when F is much more complicated. That's the trick. So it's a stair. And this is what we're going to do next. But first, we can rewrite that expression. This is nothing else than rewriting that expression in a shape that is more useful for us given the next slides. So this is dealing with initial conditions. Remember, remember, please, I was not stressing this part. But remember, when you want to solve a dynamic problem, you have to fix the problem. So the body that you want to study with its volume V, with its surface S, you have to fix the boundary conditions, otherwise you don't have a final solution, and initial conditions. For example, the system is totally quiet before I'm acting. Now it's no more quiet, but now I'm quiet, so before and after, all the displacement and other things are zero. Okay? Those are initial conditions. Okay. This is a rewriting of that expression that has a lot of dependencies inside in a shape that will be, be, that it will, that will be easier to be used given the next slide. Again, the message here. Here we have u. It will be our target. Our target is u. Write the displacement inside the Earth related to a fault. It's not there yet, but u is our target. G is the body force of the other problem. V is the solution of the other problem. F is our body force that we want to study. Now, V is the other problem. T of U are the traction of our target. U is our target. T of V is the solution of the problem that we imagine to have solved. Again, what is the role of this expression here? If we know the solution of the problem, we can use this expression to write what we want. And now, what is the easiest solution that we could know? And that's the trick. Next trick. So what we did up to now was simply rewriting the equations of elastic motion. Good. Second, uniqueness theorem. If we want to look for a solution of a specific problem, it should be there and it is unique. 
Third, Betty's theorem in two variants. That is saying, look, if you have two problems related to the same body, and if you know one, you can write the other one in terms of that one. Final step. What is the easiest problem, inhomogeneous problem, that we can imagine in our body? OK, if you want, the simplest version is this. Now you use a microphone, and you record what is the sound in this room. That's, co that's called sorry, the acoustic green sponge. Why? Because I'm not singing. I'm using the simplest excitation that you can imagine. And it is this. I don't want to do it again. It's a clap. Actually, it's a sort of explosion. It's pretty much zero in time. Pretty much zero in space. It's isotropic. Because remember, acoustics are dealing with air. And in air, we don't have shear. So isotropic problem is fine. Now, the source is here. It's me clapping here. You take a microphone there. What you're recording is the answer of a medium to the simplest excitation that you can imagine. I'm not playing the guitar. I'm not singing like a tenor here. I'm doing the simplest thing that I can do, a clap. Now, as a general definition, let's imagine that we have a differential linear operator, L. Let's imagine that we want to study an inhomogeneous problem. What does it mean? Well, it's this. It's not zero. It's something. OK. When that something is the simplest thing that you can imagine, the solution is called Green's function. In other words, the Green's function is the solution of a inhomogeneous problem when the inhomogeneous term is a depth. Like that. Wait a second. That's a definition. It's not the solution. So again, this is an important step. And this definition is valid in mathematical physics, in electrodynamics, in whatever, and also in elastodynamics. So again, let's see, imagine that we have a linear differential operator. That's one example. Do you want another? Do you want the simplest one? Oh. We did it. It was the first differential equation that we studied in wave physics, the harmonic oscillator. Now, what if the harmonic oscillator is not equal to zero, but something? Actually, if you remember, but I'm pretty much sure that you don't remember, we did it. We found resonance. And, OK, my lab is here. That's it. That's it. It's a pendulum. Well, for small angles, less than 10 on average, it's a harmonic oscillator, right? If you do remember, I was using also the, the power adapter of my computer. I can try to shake it with different. So remember, when it is equal to 0, what I just have to do is to fix initial conditions. For example, I can start from here and leave it, or start from here and give some velocity. But what if I'm shaking it? Now the problem is not homogeneous. We solve that. We solve that in wave physics, assuming that this was uh, something like that. Let's call it F to distinguish when it was an harmonic. If I'm very fast, uh, it's not working very much. If I'm very slow, it's going to follow me. But if I'm going here to resonance, wow, 
steam forcing with pretty much no amplitude, it's absor absorbing a lot of power. I hope you do remember. Well, in some way, that was an inhomogeneous problem. Now, what is the delta for this system? This. Or if you, you can imagine to have a friend on a swing, and we also deal, we try to deal with it. What you can do, okay, it's there. The period is given just by the length, not by the weight of our friend. Of course, you have friction with air, but you can imagine to force it with given frequency or to make something strange, or just to give a depth. OK, the solution to the problem, when the inhomogeneous term is a delta, it's called Green's function. So it's the solution of the inhomogeneous problem with the simplest inhomogeneous term that you can imagine. Now, when you deal with one-dimension differential operators, the delta is very simple. It's the delta in that function. Delta. Is it time? It's delta of t. In acoustics, it's delta of t in space. In elastodynamics for solids, it's more terrible because we have to fix a direction. And that makes it very, very difficult. So you could say, OK, now that we defined G, Green's function. What should we do? Is it useful? Yes. It's useful because in this very simple case, and uh, remember, this is just the definition of a Green's function. It's not the solution. The solution will, I think, on Monday. You have to wait for Monday for the solution of the Green's function for last dynamics. It will be another nightmare. But we can, we can use this definition here, and we can try to solve the most general problem. Because, look, this is just the definition of G. G is the solution of a problem when F is dead. OK? Do you agree with me? It's just a definition. What can we do next? Well, if we know G, we know the solution to the general problem. Well, you know what you can do? You take, let me go back, let's take this, okay? It's a definition. Then, okay, let's imagine to multiply on both sides the equation by F. Okay. Please remember this, OK? Now, imagine to multiply by f and by f. And let's take an integral. OK, let's give a look to this. L applied to g, by definition, is delta. And when you do the integral, sorry, it's, this part is missing. When you compute the integral of any function with a delta, you get the value of the function in that part. And that's f of x. But by definition, f of, f of x is L of u. Now, this is linear, so we can take it out. And if you give a look to this, you will see that then u is, if you want, the convolution of g with the inhomogeneous term. In other words, if we know the solution to the delta, using convolution, we can find the solution to whatever f. Actually, that's the base of linear system theory. And I'm sure that you used it. Actually, we're using every day when we make filters also for images. But the basic step is this. Let's imagine to have a linear system here in one variable. It could be time. Usually it's time, it could be space, whatever. And we know that when we input x, we get y. And we want to study the black box without opening. We can just make some questions to L. For example, what's the answer 
when the input is a delta. Let's call it H. Usually it's called impulsive function. So it's the answer of a system when we input a delta. Well, what we know is that the generic answer, Y, can just be written by X component with H. That's the base of linear systems. If a system is linear, that's working. Why? Because if it is linear, multiplication by scalars is preserved. Sum is preserved. And what is just? It's just a matter to write x in terms of the integral of the delta, make it pass, linearity, and we're getting this. It's called convolution theorem. And why? Because when you go to the Fourier transform, you get the product. And you can do filtering every day. Convolution, when you pass between domains, between time, for example, and frequency, convolution um, operation becomes normal product. And that's why you can do filtering every day. If you did some applied geophysics uh, mm -hmm. courses, yeah. you are using it. OK. Everything is based on linearity. Now, you can give a name to H or his function. It's the same. By the way, the Fourier transform of the Green's function is called transfer function. They're related by NFT. OK, just to tell you that these two slides about Green's function, actually, you have already used them. The only difference here is that we generalized it. So we give a name, Green's function, to the solution of a linear differential operator when the inhomogeneous term is a delta. OK? It's a name. Hello, it's a new friend. And the name is Green's function. Please do remember that the Green's function may have many variables. In the simplest case, it has just one time, usually. But in our case, we need time, space, and direction. Because now, what we are going to do is to give the name, the Green's function, to our differential operator. Ah. And that differential operator is not that one, is not this one, it's that one. It's our equation of elastic motion. So nothing is new in this slide here. Nothing. Because what we have, we have been using here is just the definition of the Green's function and the equations of elastic motion. That's acceleration, Newton's second law. It was already here. It was already here. It was there also in Navier equations. What about this? Well, we know that. 81, 21, 2. And we solved that. The news are here. Because now it's not equal to zero. Now it's, it, it's equal to a delta in time. The time, t equal tau, it's the source time. Okay? We measure with the clock from the time. A space is being at the origin, so it's zero. And this is the tricky part, direction. We have to establish if we're kicking in this direction, in this direction, or in that direction. And since it's direction dependent, the Green's function is a tensor. Why a tensor? Well, for two reasons. You can relax and imagine that it is symmetric. But in any case, why it's a tensor? Because, well, the solution u, the displacement, is a vector. 
So let's imagine that now I put an instrument here. It has to measure a vector, so three components. But then I can kick in three different directions, another vector. When you consider two vectors, you get a second order rank tensor. So the first index, but you can reverse that, it's telling to you the direction of a force. The other index is telling to you the direction of a component that you're studying given the direction of the source. OK? Is it clear or no? Now, please remember. OK. Let me go to the first slide that we considered today. You see that that was the good old friend, right? U is a vector, x, y, z. Because the displacement in some place has to be a vector. Then we can decompose it in horizontal and vertical, but it's a vector. So one index is there. The other index is here. Because we can give a kick in x and study x, x, x. A kick in x and study y, x, y and z, x, z. Then we can give a kick in y, three components, in z, three components. So it's a tensor. And that's why these two indexes are coupled. But luckily, uh, I'm going to skip that slide, otherwise you're going to kill me. It's symmetric. It can be proven. It's not easy, but it can be proven that you can reverse these two. It's called reciprocity. And it is valid also in optics. If you change the position of a source and of a receiver, and you reverse them, you get the same. So if you see someone, someone can see you. OK, you can demonstrate those reciprocity relations, uh, relationships once you put some polite conditions on G. But let's say that here you can interpret the first index as the direction where you're looking at the, uh, the receiver, and the other one is the direction at which was keeping the source. So you have source and receiver. In acoustics, it's much simpler. It's only a matter of position. You take a microphone somewhere, you get the G given a source here and the receiver here. But you don't have to take care about vectors, because pressure is isotropic, not in solids. Those are the bad news. OK, if you want to be a little bit more sophisticated, the next slide, but I will go very quick. So two indexes, it's a tensor, position of a receiver, position of a source. And this is just a definition. OK? We have not solved this problem. We have not solved it. We give a name G to the solution. And you can imagine that the solution is a property of a medium. Because if I take an infinite elastic homogeneous medium, I get an answer. If the system is more complicated, I get a different answer. If I clap my hands here or in the corridor, or in an empty space, or in a church, or in a building with many reverberations, the sound will be totally different. OK? That's a property of the medium. Are you getting this point? Yes. So the source is, how to say, the simplest. So simple that is letting the system to reveal its properties. That's why clapping hands is fine. In principle, it should be used a balloon or a the guns that I'm using in athletic games, something like that. But clapping hands is fine enough. So if you take the same microphone and you record the answer here, or you open the door, the system will be different. And you will get different sounds. So according to the model of the Earth that you're considering, G will be poorer or richer. It depends. So this one is just a definition. Just to make you happy because it's Friday, these are the properties of symmetry of G. The most important one is this. You can exchange indexes there. 
It's nothing else but in optics, sorry for the bad and rough words, but I'm saying now, if you, you see someone, someone is going to see you, okay? Okay, now it's time to make the last step. It's not the last. And this maybe is the most messy slide of your day. Okay, but before looking at that, let's just think. Now, we have our beautiful Earth. We put a delta somewhere, at some time, at some direction. G is given. It's given. That's the Earth. It depends just by the system that we are considering. Now we go back to the Betty's theorem, and now we use, for one of the two solutions, G, the small g there, and what was okay. That was the final version of the Betty's theorem. It was involving U and V as solutions of two problems, one related to F and the other related to small g. Now, for small g, we take a delta in space and time and direction. Immediately, V has to be capital G. So we are cleaning things, and we want to write U as a function of the solution that we know. It's like to, trying to understand L giving a kick. We study the impulse response, then we can use the impulse the impulse response to write the, gene the genetic solution. Okay, that's the logic. Okay, let's go there. So if you, we use the Betty's theorem, and for the second solution, we use the definition of the Green's function, there you go. So you could say, so what? So what can we do now? Nothing except one thing. Because up to this point, yeah, I know, it appears totally messy. Because what do we have here? Well, we have, we have a vector in some place in the Earth, some position, at some time, it will become our seismograph in two slides. Given what? Well, given the body forces, gravity of the Earth, and the Green's function. Green's function is a reaction to body forces. It has to be there. And in the, an integral over body. Let me tell you one thing. In two slides, the term will disappear. Why? Because we will not consider gravity. So the real F will disappear again. Just to Good. What do we have next? Well, after using the Gauss theorem, we have an integral over the whole surface of the Earth of what? Well, the Green's function times the traction field inside the Earth given the force that still now we have to define. Then we have this crazy stuff here with this trick here. That's the spatial derivative of the Green's function. I'm sorry, but that's algebra. Let me tell you, I, I think I prepared the version without dependencies. Yes, there you go. That is a sort of a summary. It's cleaner. What do we have here? Well, it's the first version of the representation theorem saying that, OK, if you want to study a problem in the Earth related to, some, to something that in the next one will become this, the fall. Well, what we have to know is to know the Green's function, consider the real body forces, consider what we have to represent now, and considering displacement inside the Earth and traction inside the Earth. Please remember this. OK. Still, it's not useful. But now it will become. Because now we want to make really the final step. What we want to know is to study U 
at a given point x as a function of t, our seismogram, due to a shear dislocation on a fault. Now it's time to write it. And now we are facing the last problem. Because now what we have to write is a displacement discontinuity along the surface. The surface can be whatever. Another trick that we will do is to consider a volume around the fault to compute that integral, this one, over all the surfaces. And actually, what we will consider is will be something like that. It's like a branch integral for, for complex integrals, something like that. And that's the last tricky part from an algebraic point of view. But that expression will be simpler now. Because now we want to really explicit the sources that we want to study. OK. Now we have many possibilities. We could try to study the motion related to an impact of a meteorite. No, we don't. We can write the, study the displacement related to a big storm. No, we don't. What do we want to study? is the displacement related to an internal source of the Earth. We don't want to, to consider external forces. Kicks coming from the space, asteroids coming from the No, we want to study something that is internal. If it is internal, the energy balance and momentum balance should be there. So at the end of the story, a floating source needs to have two very simple, how to say, um, properties. The sum of the forces before and after has to be the same. The sum of the moments before and after has to be the same. For example, I'm opening this door, but I'm an external force in the door. The door is not going to be opened by itself. Okay? So if the total moment is zero, there are no external forces. And what we, what we want to study actually is something that is pushing on this side creating a shear dislocation. This is what we want to study. OK? Is it clear, the, the, the logic? I hope so. So we introduce here a plane, or a surface more generally, that we are going to call sigma, where we have a shear dislocation. And that's why the trick will be to compute an integral over the two sides of the surface with two normals now the surface will have a sigma pair, mi plus and mi minus, and to compute that integral. That's a tricky part. That's an algebraic tricky part. But if you trust me, or if you don't trust me, but if you read Akin Richards or if you trust the things, the expression that you can write is much simpler. You, could, you should say simpler. No, it's not simpler. It's like the other one. No, there is one difference, one important difference. The first term is the same, because of the integral over the whole volume of body forces. Let me tell you, next slides, it will disappear. The integral over the whole surface of the Earth, actually, is left only with an integral over the place of discontinuity, sigma. That's the fault. All the other terms actually have been healed here, and what is left is just this part. And what we have to take here is an integral over the surface of the fault of what? Of a green function times discontinuity in stresses. The square bracket here is the difference between the two values across the fault. But wait a second. This will be zero for a pure tectonic earthquake. So, so this term will disappear. What we are left is with this messy thing here that actually the square brackets of U means the displacement discontinuity. That's the earthquake. And what we have to take care of is the stress tensor 
the normal of a surface, let's be normal, and the spatial derivative of a Green's function. Now, all this messy expression will leave only the final part. And the final part, you can imagine now, that is already containing something that I told you. Mu. What is mu? What is mu in the last term? It's inside C. Because C is the tensor that is relating the stress and strain. Okay. What is A? Oh well, that's the integral over the surface. It's here. What is the average of u? It's here. It's the integral over the surface of the discontinuity in displacement. That's why I'm torturing you with these slides, because it's the only way to understand where the seismic moment is coming. It's there. It's not only the seismic moment because there is something more, directions. One direction is here. The normal of a fault could be something like that. If I tell you, look, the normal of a fault is this vector with unitary amplitude, we know the fault. Do you remember the final slides of the last lecture? We said, OK, the fault can be described by a strike, a dip, and the movement there. OK. But the fault itself can be described by the normal. So this one is giving us the direction of the plane or of the surface. And then we have another direction, this. That's the derivative of a Green's function along a spatial coordinate. Let's try to use intuition and not accurate algebra. What is a Green's function? Well, in some way, it's related to a force, by definition. It's containing the direction of the force, right? Now, if I take a, a force and a computer derivative, it's like to create an arm for that force. So actually, it's like a couple. This term here is like a couple, with the direction pointing along P and the arm pointing along Q. And we have a distribution of couples along the fold. Representation theorem is perfect. Now let's make the final steps. And, and let me tell you one thing. I know, this is a massive problem. But there is no way out if we want to deeply understand where seismic moment is coming. Okay? So it's, it's a hard path, but no way out if you want to deeply go there. Second, it's so messy because here it is considering the most general situation with a lot of indexes running around. You will see I don't think today, but at the beginning of the next lecture, when we are going to consider a specific case where the fault will be established, the normal will be established, the direction of slip will be established, how this messy game of indexes will collapse into something similar. So that's the general part. You will see in a specific case how the, the things are, should be a little bit similar. And you will understand also the physical meaning of this, I hope. So let's go towards that part. And to go towards that part, we need to make a bridge. And maybe it's the final one. Because now we are really pinning what we want to start. Keywords. In the case of a shear dislocation, what does it mean? The tractions across the fold are continuous. 
we're not dealing with explosions, okay, or implosions. They are continuous. What is not continuous is the displacement field. Okay, that's the slip. It's our slip field. Good. So the tractions across sigma, that is the fault plane, are continuous. So you do understand that the second term before will vanish. So just to relax you. This term will vanish because this quantity here is related to discontinuity of t across the fold. No, it's zero. This term will vanish. Why? Because I'm lazy and it's Friday. Because gravity is not important for seismology T's, but not that important. Okay? Also, that term will vanish. The question that we're going to, to answer in the next slide is, okay, can we write this term here like this one? Because if yes, the F that we're creating is the equivalent body force system. Okay? That's the representation of it. Okay. So, forget about this. Forget about this. Consider this, and let's try to write it like that one. Now, look. That's the expression of a spatial derivative. Along this variable here, that is pointing along the Q, could be X, Y, or Z. Okay? So the arm could be along X, Y, or Z. Of something that is a Green's function, that is related to a force pointing in P. Remember, Green's function is the solution with index N of a force pointing in P. So the couple PQ here is expressing a couple arm in Q, direction in P. We can rewrite this. You can prove that you can rewrite it using deltas in this way here. That's algebra. Nothing more than algebra. Then, using this, we can rewrite the third term, this one, in this way. So you could say, so what? Well, that's the seismogram in a point of the Earth related to a shear dislocation on a fault that can be written like that. That's the Green's function. We have not found it yet, but we imagine to know that. Convolved with FP. What is FP? Well, that's the earthquake. So actually, representation theorem is saying, look, you can take your beautiful Earth with a volume V, with an external surface S, with boundary conditions, with initial conditions starting from a given time when the earthquake is going to occur. You can take your fault and forget about it. What you can do is to replace the fault with a system of body forces, because that's a system of body forces. Of course, all the information is here. Because the body forces will have a given amplitude and it's related to average of U. To the material, it's inside C. To a given direction, it's inside the normal. And with given directions that are, that are related by derivative, so delta related to the derivative in Q. Now, I know it's messy. But the final message is the displacement due to a shear dislocation of the Earth is equivalent to the perfectly equivalent to the displacement caused by a system of body forces. That's, that's why it's called representation of fear. So you take the fault, you forget it, and you replace it with something that is a mess of forces. Is it good? Yes, because we can solve it. Now, that's the most general formulation of a representation theorem. In principle, with this one, you can write whatever, given the more complicated fault on the Earth, because it's not necessarily a plane, 
could be something with the knee that is bearing, in a medium that could be inhomogeneous and anisotropic. And you can replace the fault with this, because later we're going to use that. Now, just to relax you, and, and I know it's not enough to relax you, but the summary of the presentation theorem is here. The displacement, it's a vector. So n is the three components of the displacement. Our seismograph, what do we want to study? In a point x, maybe here, in time, t can be written, in general, as convolution of body forces with the Green's function over a volume v. But the laziness will cause this term to be zero. Plus, integral over a surface where we can have a discontinuity of tractions, but we don't have them, zero. And what we are left is this, the integral over the fold of a slip field decided by directions of a norma of a fold and this comma q here that will be related to the discontinuity of displacement. And that's the summary without indexes. This is a representation of for a pure shear dislocation. And that was the toughest part for today. Because now that we're a little bit broken, but on the top, now we can look around and see if something, if the panoramic view is nice or not. And now we're going to define the most important quantities or source in a Because what we have left is this. Now, if you want to save one expression of the old course, you can take the one on the top. You could say, no, come back, it's too complicated. Well, it's not that complicated if you think about it, because it's containing the displacement of the Earth related to a shear dislocation on a fault. So it's not that complicated. We have the slip field, the material, the direction of the fault, the Green's function, that's the medium, remember, that's the string, that's the player, with this. Now, this derivative can be thought as the equivalent of having a single couple with the direction field of force and the arm in Q. Now, you can imagine that we have just nine possibilities. It should be symmetric xx, x, xy, xz, blah, blah, blah. You will see this. OK, so the directions are given by P and Q. P, R, Q. That's the arm. What about the strength? Well, the strength is given by the amount of slip in that point of the fold. Then we move, then we move, and we have an integral. Now, let's use a definition. And we define a quantity that is like that, that is called density of moment tensor or moment density tensor. You could say moment. Yes, it's a moment. Because actually, if you look at it, we have u, it's the displacement, it's the slip. OK? So it's a displacement. Times what? Well, times the constitutive law between stress and strain. In the simplest case, it's lambda or mu. Elastic parameters, pressures. So it's a force over a surface. This has no unit. It's just a unitary vector just telling the direction of the fault. Why it's called? Moment tensor, well, it's a tensor because it has two indexes. Uh, remember that here, um, index, repeated index convention. And why it's density? Because it's inside this. When you multiply this by an area, it's a moment. Now, with this definition, for lazy people, this expression becomes exactly this. Adjust the definition. But with this expression, 
it's easy to remember that in each point on the fault, you have a force pointing in P, a norm pointing in Q, so you're creating a couple, with a strength that is given by this. Simpler and simpler. And the units are okay. Good. Final steps. Because since we have been so brave to stay on the top, the terrible path, now maybe looking around we can find something interesting here. Because for example now we can say, come on, it's Friday. And we're lazy. So let's consider an isotropic solid. If the solid is isotropic, things are getting much more cleaner. Why? Because we're we are left, not with 81, not with 21, but just with 2. And that definition of NPQ becomes much simpler. Now, let's give a look to that. Remember, repeated index summation. So we have lambda, and lambda is related more to compressions and expansions, as you remember, it's in the P-wave velocity. Times what? Well, that's a scalar product of what? Well, of me and you. What is me? What is you? Now, you is the slip. And the slip is on the fault. Okay? So it can move somewhere with a given amplitude, everywhere. It could be very heterogeneous, but it is on the fault for pure shear dislocation, right? What is me? Well, me is the normal. So you and me are always perpendicular for a pure shear dislocation. Of course, if I take the two sides of a fault and I'm opening them, it's no more true. But for a pure shear dislocation, you will, will stay here. So it will be always perpendicular to me. What does it mean? But the first term that is a scalar product will be zero because we are perpendicular. And we're left just with the second writing, this one. OK, what do we have there? Well, we have mu because it's related just to shear. Mu. We have the amount of u at each point. It's the amount of slip spread over the fold. So you can imagine now that if we stay so far from the source, that we imagine everything focused in a point, it's like to make an average because we have, we have to compute the integral. And what is left? Is the integral of this quantity here mu times a because it's an integral over the surface of the average of u. Now, by definition, defining m as the average of a density of a moment tensor, we are left with a moment tensor. And this beautiful expression is the keystone of all theoretical seismology that you can imagine. Because now, all the source information is contained in MPQ. That is, a tensor, second order, symmetric, PQ, QP. You can reverse it. It's symmetric. So just six components. All the massive thing on the fold is in six components. That will become the focal mechanism. <clears throat> okay, so MPQ is the source. And if you convolve it with the Green's function, we're done. The Green's function is the, is the property of the medium. Wait a second. It's not only the Green's function, it's the derivative of the Green's function. That's the complication of the earth. Spatial derivative. 
But M contains the source, G contains the medium. So if you want to do direct problem, if you want to compute synthetic seismograms in the Earth, you can put here an M representing your source, a G representing your medium, and you compute synthetics. Vice versa, do you want to do tomography? OK, you have to study G. You have to fix M. Do you want to study the source? Well, fix G and study M. That's focal mechanism inversion. This formula here is the simplest and most powerful expression in seismology. But please do remember what we have done to arrive to that expression there. Because the final step was the toughest one. Because to go from here to here, we are averaging everything in a point. It's called point source approximation. What does it mean? It means that we have to be, for that hypothesis to be effective, so far from the source that all the radiations from the different points should be seen as coming from one. Now the question is the following, since we are going towards the end. Are these point sources? Uh, my intention was to wake you up. Are those point sources? No. No. Is the star a point source? A star. You said yes, because we are very far. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, it's not but since we are now, if you go 100 meters from here, definitely each square will be seen as a point. And maybe the four squares will be seen as a point. So it depends on the relative distance by the receive, from the receiver to the source. That's the approximation. So it depends on the ratio between the dimensions of the source and your distance. If you are so far, if you are 10,000 kilometers from Tohoku event, maybe that's a point. If it is a point, then you can perform this, this integral. And you can squeeze everything in a point where you have mu, a, and u. Moment, seismic moment is there. But it's not a moment, it's a tensor. And that's the final slide that we're going to see today. The two final slides. Three final slides. Because actually, now that we have defined a seismic moment, we can imagine to do something. First, it's symmetric. Look, if you change P and Q, it's symmetric. Wait a second. Nature knows where the source and the fault is. We cannot distinguish between the fault and the given U on the fault and the given normal discovering the fault from the opposite. We cannot. Because from the point of view of the seismic radiation, it's the same. If you change P and Q, you get the same. We are blind from the fault plane and what we're going to call the auxiliary plane. Nature knows. Or, if you want, you will see a practical example. You can ask a geologist. From the point of view of a seismologist, P and Q can be reversed. But the geologist will say, no, 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 wait a second. The normal is this one and not this one. Okay? That's a possibility. But from our point of view, it's symmetric. So we have an ambiguity, an internal ambiguity. We can distinguish between P and Q. It's symmetric. But good news about symmetry, because since it's symmetric, it can be diagonalized. Every symmetric second order tensor can be diagonalized. So we can find the reference system for which we have just the diagonal terms that are the eigenvalues. Good to know. M1, M2, M3. Now we compute the trace, we compute the sum, and we divide it by one third. That part we call it isotopic. This part we call it deviatoric. We can do whatever. Now the isotopic part for a pure sheet dislocation will be zero. Because the Total sum is related if it is positive to explosion, if it is negative to implosions. So we're less just with the 
the Vietoric one. And if the total moment is zero, definitely the sum has to be zero because it's an internal source. We're not going, look, I can move this table here and give a kick from outside. Total moment is not necessarily zero. Actually, it's not. But if I'm going to, if I, <clears throat> I don't know how to push this table be inside the table. But that's tectonics. It's an internal engine. So the total moment has to be zero. What does it mean? That the sum of a moment, of a seismic moment, has to be zero because it corresponds to, no, sorry, too fast. The sum of the eigenvalues here is related to the total force of the system. If the source is internal, it has to be zero. And the trace has to be zero, first condition. If also the moment has to be zero, one of them has to be zero, like that. <coughs> OK. Now, if the earthquake that we consider is a pure shear dislocation, where the resultant is zero, the total sum of the forces is zero. The total moment is zero, so it's an internal shear dislocation that has to be the situation. Because the total sum is related to total forces, and total moment to be zero has to be plus minus zero. Now, that configuration, for a point source, this means that we are also so far from the source that we squeeze everything inside the point, well, this one is called double couple. And you will see in a second why. Now, what is left is just m0 minus m0. And what is m0? Well, by definition, it's mu, because we are left just with mu here. You see? Just mu. It's a pure shear dislocation. A, where it's coming from? From this. Because we are averaging all the fault. Nu is the property of a material in terms of shear forces. A is related to the area of the rupture. And U, this one, actually is the average of slip on the fault. That seismic moment, it has the units of the moment. Force of an area times area times mu. It's a moment. It's Newton times meters. You could say also it's work, so energy. Yes, but in this case here, is representing a moment. A moment of what? Well, it's the moment of each of the two couples that will form the earthquake, because we have two. Because now, when you write your seismic moment, tensor. According to the principal axis, you have just two components, plus m0, minus m0, 0. But once you move from the principal axis, these two components can become other components. And you will see, I hope, on Monday, what's the meaning. The net result of these two components here will be a double couple. Each of the couples will have a moment m0, but opposite. So one will have plus m0, the other will have minus m0, the total moment is 0, the total result is 0, everything is fine, and the double couple is the equivalent body force for an earthquake occurred on the fault with a given slip, but as a point. And if you want to give a look to the momentous of components, in general, there you go, and here we stop. Look. Let's think about it. One, one, for example. It's MPQ. This one. One, one, what does it mean? For example, one is X. So we have two forces pointing along X, and the arm is in X. Y, Y. Uh, pardon, in this direction. Z, Z. Look now. If you imagine to take the diagonal terms, and you put them together, it will be an explosion. You change the sign, it will be an implosion. No explosion, no implosion. The total sum has to be zero. And we 
is at the best we see. Now, what be the off-diagonal terms? For example, 1, 2, n and 2, 1. That will be the example of plan we are going to consider this one. Well, 1, 2 means, OK, the force is in x. The arm is in, OK, y. So we have a couple like that. 1, 1, and the arm is in 2. 1, 3 will be 1, the arm is here, like that. All the possible combinations here. But please remember this for today, waiting for the single case that we're going to discuss on Monday. That at this point here, actually, you can use moment tensor also to represent explosions. Because you can take the diagonal terms, all equal, all positive, and you will represent an explosion. That's not a shear dislocation. Do you want to mimic an implosion? All equal, negative. Shear dislocation, all equal, zero. But to have a double couple, you need to switch on, for example, this and this. And you will have something like that. Now, where the earthquake? as finished. The amplitude of the average of a slip is in M0. That is here. So that's the average of the earthquake that occurred in a medium with a mm, rigidity modulus mu over an area A with an average slip u. That's it. Usually, this is called seismic moment or scalar seismic moment because it has no direction. It has units, but no direction. What is the direction? It's here. It's in the skeleton. So you can imagine the moment tensor, seismic moment tensors, with skeletons of 1 and zeros here, according to what you want to describe, and an amplitude that is related to the seismic moment scalar. That's why the most important and that's the end for today, really, expression is here. MPQ, you can imagine that MPQ is a skeleton of 1 and zeros sp spread in this matrix, 3 by 3, symmetric. And the scalar quantity is here, that is in M0. So the source and the medium. Remember, but that derivative will tell us how to place the double couple to represent the fault. You will see that on map. So again, to close this part, why representation of theorem? Because it's telling us, OK, you can take your beautiful Earth with a fault, with a discontinuity there, throw the fault, and replace it with the system of body forces. If you're so far that the source can be considered a point, what is left is a double couple. And what you need is just MPQ. Six quantities. It's nothing with respect to the complexity that you can imagine. Please remember that still we have to define G. We simply, no, not to define, we have to solve. We have defined G. Okay? It's the solution of elastic equations of motion when we have a delta in a place at a time in a given direction. Okay? Elastodynamic Green's function. Representation theorem is using that to express the displacement related to something else that in our case is a network. So, wait for some minutes. So, the next, the final slides here will be a simple, explicit case in the I hope that you will understand that. Okay? Okay. Please, for today, remember this. Very powerful. It's the base of pretty much everything. What is MPQ? What is here? And what is M0? So, please remember that this quantity here will enter in the definition of 9 meter. Just to tell you. So it's really the simplest and most important quantity in the source, at least. OK, see you on Monday. Um, you know that not the next week, but the next week plus one, we have to move one lecture because you have to go to the colloquium by, by the string uh, theoretician. OK, you know. Um, I shifted the um, lecture on Tuesday. 
So not only wet, 11, but Q, the Q before. But you will see on the calendar, I just did see it with Patrizia. Okay. Have a nice weekend. Now you can speak with your friends about seismic moment and moment also. I hope not.